So last week's topic was focused on uh, Dr. Engelkin did some stuff with uh, necropsies for us from the feedlot side of things. And today we've asked Dr. Dan Loy to join us. He is a former, um, our director of the Iowa Beef Center, recently retired and enjoying retirement, it sure sounds like. Um, we've asked him to come back and talk to us about some uh, <clears throat> pros and cons of various feedlot facility types and kind of what the research says about cattle performance and, and some of those other things that go along with it. Um, we will ask that if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box now so you can remember those. Uh, sometimes it gets hard to hang on to those questions, uh, but it'll likely be towards the end of, of today, our discussion before we really address any of those questions, but feel free to ask them at any time so that they're out there and we can uh, address those accordingly. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Loy. Um, I'll turn it over to you. All right, can you hear me okay, Erica? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for that introduction, and uh, and we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, if there we go. Um, so Erica mentioned that that uh, I was asked to talk about some of the pros and cons of different feedlot types, and really, I think we need to start with what your what our goals are or what they should be, and basically that is excellent animal health, uh, animal welfare, predictable performance, and at a reasonable cost. And that seems relatively straightforward, but I think a lot of that. Uh, depends on economics at the time. We'll touch on that a little bit, uh, but also about where you're located. And just as an example, uh, this is a graph that I put together for another talk a, a while ago. These are three cattle feeding areas around the world. Um, and I just have Des Moines representing uh, the upper Midwest, but I have Goiania, Brazil, and this is the average, temp average temperature throughout the year. And also Calgary, Canada. We know there's a, a, a uh, cattle feeding industry up there in, in Alberta in that region. And so basically what this shows is that if you look at summer temperatures, our summer temperatures in Des Moines are on par with the su summer temperatures in Guayana, Brazil. And of course, Southwest Iowa would be slightly warmer than that. If we look at winter temperatures, our winter temperatures are consistent with what we would see in Calgary, Alberta. So I think the Really, what we're talking about in, in the upper Midwest is that we can have either tropical summers or Arctic winters in any given year or at any given time. And so a lot of what we do in terms of mitigating uh, the, these environmental challenges is related to facilities, and that's what we'll talk about today. The other factor that is significant as we look at different regions in terms of uh, cattle feeding, cattle per, uh, uh, and the environmental impact is precipitation. If you look at this line, and that line is just a few miles west of where Erica's office is, maybe at the most 100 miles, uh, if you go west of that line, evaporation exceeds precipitation. If you go east of that line, then precipitation exceeds evaporation. What that means is there will be certain times of the year where the water, the, the precipitation that we get is going to accumulate. And for earthen feedlots, dirt feedlots, that means mud. And mud is maybe the most challenging issue environmentally uh, and that we have to mitigate from an uh, environmental standpoint. I don't know how well you can see it, but if you look very closely, there's even a difference within the state of Iowa. You notice Northwest Iowa has more evaporation relative to precipitation than Eastern Iowa or Southeast Iowa. And for that reason, we do see differences in feedlots as we go from, especially from southwest to northeast. We see more open feedlots with mounds in the southwest Iowa, and then more concrete uh, paved feedlots in eastern Iowa. And that's been something that, that we've seen for, for many, many years. So really what we have to deal with, especially here in our region, are environmental challenges. The, the main environmental challenges are cold stress, heat stress, and mud. And some of the, the mitigations from a facility standpoint are the same across those, and some of those are different. So we'll just touch on those very quickly. We look first at cold stress. Cold stress solutions primarily is shelter. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but you know the historical data comparing feedlot facilities in Iowa, Minnesota, in this region shows that if we have a building or we have access to shelter, uh, that provides not only cold stress um, 
you know, reduction in winds, st stress and so forth, but also shade in the summertime. And it will add improve feed efficiency by about 5%. And historically that's been enough in much of our state to justify uh, the cost of a building. The other is wind breaks. And I think that's the, in, in Iowa, that's the minimally, um, the minimal environmental protection that we should include in a feedlot. This photo in the lower right is from Alberta, Canada, where it's dry, but it gets very cold and windy. And so you'll notice that the, the wind breaks surround the pens in those feedlots. And there's because they get little precipitation, there's not ne necessarily need for much slope or mounds or that type of thing. The other is bedding. Bedding helps insulate the animals. Uh, so, and, and reduce the heat loss through conduction that goes uh, as they're resting uh, in, in uh, cold temperatures. The second one is mud. And during certain times of the year, typically the next two or three months, we'll start seeing mud issues in a lot of our feedlots, especially depending on the precipitation and so forth. Uh, because we don't have that those warm temperatures to drive evaporation. And so it, it tends to, uh, if we aren't able to reduce uh, the, or increase the, the runoff or from the feedlot or reduce the amount of mud, that can be a major issue. Uh, mud can reduce the insulation value of their hair coat. It's, it costs energy just to move around in, in the mud. And we've seen significant reductions in feed intake and reductions in performance um, uh, for uh, cattle based on issues related to mud. The primary mitigation for that is mounds and slope, especially in dirt lots. We see a lot of those again down in Southwest Iowa. And so uh, if we have enough good pen maintenance to, um, to have the, the water go into the, the runoff uh, facility fairly quickly. If we can manage it from that standpoint, uh, that can be very helpful. Um, this, the second, or in, well, the third mitigation strategy is just a paved feedlot or a concrete feedlot. And again, because we get more rainfall in the eastern part of the state, we see a lot more concrete feedlots in that region, although they exist all over the state of Iowa. One of the trends, and I won't talk about it much because there's not a lot of research with it, we may see more uh, in, in the future uh, with paved feedlots, we'll come back to that, is the roller compacted concrete, which depending on economies, the size um, of the feedlot in question can be a way to reduce the cost of concrete for building new feedlots. So those are the solutions for mud. For heat stress, um, in we, you know, heat stress, the obvious signs are increased respiration by the animal. We see this open mouth breathing, like what we see with this animal right here, uh, we're looking at 10 to 14% increase in their maintenance requirements. And we're also seeing reductions of feed intake during these periods as much as 30, 40% or more. So that's a major issue. The number one solution for heat stress is shade. Uh, we found with some, uh, uh, some incidents that happened in Southwest Iowa that if we provided shade based on surveys, we could reduce the death loss on those high heat stress incidents to, to nearly zero or very significantly. Whereas cattle in the open lot without shade, that's where we saw the significant death losses. So shade is important and that shade can be a well ventilated, a well ventilated building that was constructed for winter protection. So shade is, is, uh, is an issue because cattle um, cool by evaporation, sprinklers is the second uh, heat stress mitigation. And certainly you, both of those can be a factor in terms of reducing uh, reducing heat stress incidents. So those are, you know, just from a cattle comfort standpoint, that's what we're dealing with. And so we're looking at what is the best way for in your in situation with the costs that are available to reduce those, those issues. So what do Iowa feedlot facilities look like? And um, this is a survey that's very outdated. It's nine years old now. And uh, I think there's been quite a bit of changes, but this is probably the best data that we have at the moment, just to give us a kind of a thumb on the pulse of what's out there. So in 19, or 2014, we did a survey of cattle feedlot operations. This included every feedlot over a thousand head and a statistical sample of those under 200 head. And 51% were open lots with shelter. Only so 19% were bedded confinements, 4% were deep bedded confinements. So only less than 25% were confinement buildings. 
That was in 2014. When we asked those same producers, what if they'd expanded what type of facility they had built in the prior five years, so this would be up to 2014, and 50% were confinement. And I would say today, or since that time, any new construction in Iowa, well, the majority has been some type of confinement building. Um, early in that time period, the deep bedded buildings, we see a lot of those, but more recently we've seen a trend towards uh, slatted floor um, uh, confinement systems uh, and, and a lot of popularity in those particular systems. We'll talk about all of those um, next. So what are the different types of facilities? Uh, and these are the ones that we compared and I'm gonna share with you some, some data um, the on feedlot costs that we did a few years ago and then some updated costs that are maybe a little more relevant today. Uh, but these, I wanna go through an example or uh, just describe the systems that we compared. So this is the earthen lot with a shed. This is very popular, especially down there in Erica's area in Southwest Iowa, we see a lot of these. In fact, uh, South Dakota State did a facility comparison over several years and their system that was like this they uh, affectionately called the Iowa system. So earthen lot with open lot with a shelter. And this is just an example of an open lot with a shelter. This happens to be our Armstrong Strong research uh, facility uh, down there in Lewis, Iowa. The second one is a concrete lot with a shelter. Um, it, it, with the, the open lots, you know, we would, depending on the slope and the soil types and so forth, we'd require at least 200, 250 square foot per head in the upper Midwest. With the paved lot, we can reduce that. It's a little more maintenance because we're concentrating the cattle a little bit more, but we'd like to see at least 20 square feet inside and 30 square feet outside for a total of, of 50 square feet per head. Many of them will have more uh, spacing than that because it reduces the amount of scraping and maintenance that's required, but that's kind of what we included for our facility comparisons. This is an example of one up in Nashua, Iowa. It's been in use for many, many years. This feedlot gets very, very good performance and, uh, and is relatively simple. I, I mentioned it does require some maintenance. You see the bedding here, the, the uh, apron here is scraped very routinely, maybe a couple times a week. Uh, the, you know, I mentioned the deep bedded confinement. There's several different kinds of those out there. Um, we have what I call the narrow monoslope, which is typically about 50 feet um, deep, um, the hoop buildings, which are 45 to 50 foot deep. We have the double monoslope. I call it double because there's bunks on both sides, which would be about 100%, 100 feet wide. And then basically the way these would be constructed uh, for the narrow monoslopes is that there would be about one foot of bunk space per animal, just to give you an idea of what the, 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 the uh, uh, size of these buildings would be. Uh, we'll see a lot of these narrow monoslopes built for 300 to 500 head. Uh, the wide monoslopes we can see for 200 or 1500 to as many as 2000 head or more. So depending on the size you need, uh, you see some differences in these types of facilities. Uh, basically, the way those facilities are managed is that bedding is added throughout the feeding period uh, to pre create a bedding pack, and then that the the the, the uh, bedding pack is scraped around the outside and that produces a dry place for the animals to lay down. Uh, a few years ago, Jeff Pasteur, who's with uh, Quality Liquid Feeds, and he's working on his uh, uh, master's degree here at Iowa State, was able to collect almost a thousand head of closeouts from uh, Land Lakes Purina and looked at the difference in performance between deep bedded buildings and open lots. And what he found was about a 5% improvement in daily gain and a 6% improvement in feed efficiency. And remember I said that uh, we, the historic data shows about a 5% improvement in efficiency to having access to shelter. That's consistent with what we see here. Uh, research from the uh, Opportunities Farm at South Dakota State uh, is very similar to this. Uh, I'll look forward to, there's a new, uh, uh, feed different types of feedlot that are being built at the University of Nebraska right now that will be doing long term facility compar comparisons. I'll look forward to seeing uh, that data, um, in, you know, uh, as we go forward in the future. The other thing that's important here, this is some closeouts that were summarized by Dr. Garland Dalkey in our office from cooperators with uh, 
that he runs closeouts for or assists in running closeouts for. And the interesting thing it shows here, when he compared the open yards to confinement, the average daily gain wasn't that much different. In fact, during this period, it might have been slightly higher for the open yards, but the variation was almost twice what it was in the open yards compared to confinement. So when we talk about consistent performance, you know, depending on when you look at it, you may not see improvements based on, um, in, you know, increases in the cost of confinement, but you may have more predictability, which allows you to be more consistent in terms of purchasing cattle and break evens and that type of thing. So predictability is a, is a factor as well. Uh, I mentioned solid floor confinement and, and how it's managed. I won't belabor that. And then the final one is the complete confinement with a slatted uh, floor. And so here we're looking at uh, manure storage, depending on the depth of the, the, uh, the facility, um, it, we can have, you know, from eight months to a year of manure storage, maybe less if it's a shallower one that has a flush system or something like that. But basically this is handled as liquid manure. Um, the costs are higher. Um, but uh, there are some advantage to the to the slatted floor confinement that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Just a couple examples of slatted floor confinement. Um, many, or if not most, of the newer construction that's being built includes rubber mats. Um, and the I'd say the average of the studies that have compared performance do show an improved performance with rubber mats. Um, maybe not always, but certainly improvements in animal welfare, lameness, those issues, I think, uh, are enough to justify the added expense of the rubber mats. So our analysis that we did, and this was back in 2016, and I'll, I'll show you some updated analysis as well. But our initial analysis, we looked at the initial investment of different types of facilities, their annual costs, the cost per head, what's the break-even yardage would need to be to pay for these buildings, and then the cost of different environmental structures, depending on the footprint of the feedlot. I will mention that a team that's led by uh, Russ Yukon on the Beef Center team is currently starting to update this because uh, a lot of things have changed in terms of costs and manure values and those types of things since that time. But I do want to share with you what we found and, and what kind of where we're at right now. So these were our initial uh, investment or what it would cost at that time. And this was based on, on surveys of contractors. Basically a new uh, dirt lot with just a windbreak was about 400 head. Uh, a shed almost doubled that cost. We looked at um, the concrete lot with the shed was about $900 per head space, $700 for the deep, solid floor confinement. And I think that's one of the reasons that was so popular at that time and about $1,200 for the slatted floor confinement. And, but as I mentioned, those, those numbers are, are likely out of date. So along with that, we developed this decision tool that will allow you to plug in your own numbers. So in this case, there's an open lot with a windbreak, a confinement, confinement with slats, and basically look at the different costs, look at the expected performance, and, uh, and do an assessment of different facilities that you might be considering uh, purchasing. The other factor that figures in, remember the, the slatted floor confinement has a much higher construction cost than say an open lot, for example. But the other factor that we found during that time frame is that the net value per headspace per year for the open lot was about $20 per head for the slatted floor confinement, the deep pit confinement. It was over twice that amount, about $53 per head. So that can mitigate some of those initial construction costs. And if you look at what's happened to fertilizer costs, and this was uh, an update from last year, there we're looking at uh, open lot values of $53 a head and values of, in, the slat or in the pit confinement of nearly $90 per head. So that factors in as well. So if you are a farmer feeder, you're utilizing your manure, doing it effectively and having a manure management plan that allows you to utilize those nutrients, then that is, has a lot of value in terms of offsetting costs for uh, construction of these different feedlot facilities. So I mentioned what we used back in 2016. We know that commodity prices have increased. Steel has increased. Lumber increased dramatically during COVID. It's decreased some, but it's still higher than it was in 2016. Concrete has 
marched its way up. So all of these factors uh, have are increased factors that have increased the cost of different facilities. So in 23, with again with uh, Russ Yukon's help, who, who's uh, the one that's leading the the update that we're uh, they're starting to work on right now, we did an update for 2023, and here we estimated that the open lot with the windbreak, and that's I'm just going to compare the three with the red bars, was $900 per head cost, and you can argue with any of these depending on how much, you know, whether you can buy materials at at uh, lower costs if you do some of your own labor uh, all of these factors fit into this but so these are just examples based on uh, some some surveys of, of builders that Russ did uh, the solid floor confinement about 1600 and the slatted floor confinement at that time about 23 dollars again that's per head space so with that we took those costs and ran them through our um, facility assessment calculator, and that can be downloaded from the IOB Center website. If you just go to our publication, it's a, it's a link that's there, or uh, it can be found. I'm sure Erica or Beth can uh, put the link to that up uh, um, at some point on the YouTube page or, or somewhere where you can access it. Um, but we plug those numbers into the, the, uh, the calculator, looking at relatively uh, current feed prices, I think corn price has probably gone down somewhat, so your cost of gain may be lower than this. But basically, we calculated a cost of gain for $1.18 with the earthen lot with the windbreak, $1.21 for the slatted floor confinement, and $1.24 for the total confinement. However, our manure value per cost of gain was $0.06, cents, $0.12, cents, and $0.15. Cents. So if we look at the total cost of gain, now we're looking at the that the, the two confinement systems are comparable, if not slightly lower than the open lot system with current costs. Again, you need to plug in your own costs, your own values, but there's good tools there to help you do that. In terms of a, the break-even comparison, if we look at just the break-even prices, and that was kind of an arbitrary feeder price and numbers have gone up since then. Maybe I should just skip down to the break-even yardage charge. So based on those costs, um, our break-even yardage charge would be about 70 cents per head per day to pay for this facility, all of our operating costs and labor, et cetera. Um, 98 cents for the solid floor confinement and a dollar eight for the uh, um, slatted floor confinement. Now that does not include the manure value. So that means you're taking the manure value as a profit. So whether you include that, uh, subtract that in your yardage is kind of at your discretion. So that gives you an example of kind of where we're at now. Uh, I do look forward to updates on that publication and, and what some of our analysis have been, but there are tools out there to help you make some of those decisions as you go forward. So this is the publication itself and the link is there. So, and again, that was back in 2016, but it does give some good examples, it goes through a process that you might go through in terms of making those decisions. Also on the page, if you go to that link, is also a link to the facility uh, decision tool uh, spreadsheet. It's an Excel file, basically, is what it what it is. So just kind of just to summarize where we're we're heading now, I think we've seen a lot of we've seen a trend in increases in um, more popularity with the slatted floor confinement system. I mentioned the manure value. That's a huge reason. A lot of farmer feeders are doing that. It's kind of the swine model. We build buildings uh, where we can utilize that manure for cropping systems. And as manure costs and fertilizer costs increase and the value of the crops become uh, higher, that has an increase, uh, an increased value. The other one that we, we, uh, we, we probably don't have quite as good a data as we need. We have some, a few surveys that document this is that there's less labor and, and significantly less bedding. With the deep bedded buildings, yes, you get good performance. Uh, you're hauling in um, uh, a lot of bedding, four to five pounds a day is typical bedding. Uh, but from our surveys, we'd seen two to 10, uh, but four to five pounds is something that we'd see. Um, and then we have to haul that out and, and spread that. The, the manure value is still more than in an open lot. But because we do have some composting in the bedding pack, it's less than if it was a liquid system. Basically with the liquid system, 
we're capturing 95% or more of the nitrogen. In an open lot, we lose about half the nitrogen as ammonia. And in a deep bedded system, uh, we capture about 70 to 75% of the nitrogen. So that's really what the, where the differences in the manure value are coming in. Uh, in terms of labor, um, potential reasons for that, you know, you have, you know, you can perhaps walk the pens more quickly. Uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, um, walk, there, there, there's just a lot of good evidence that there is some less labor than that. And again, with the, both the confinement systems, there's uh, more consistent performance. I think is even though we may not be able to document always a year round better performance in an open lot with a shelter, the performance may be more consistent. But they come with a higher construction cost, which you know construction cost needs to be monitored and, and accounted for as well. So with that, Erica, I think we're we've got plenty of time for questions. 